There we go. All right, everyone, welcome back to Apologetics Together. We're still on John of Damascus. And um, let me share my screen here. Whoops. Ah, where'd you go? There you go. Okay. Almost thought I lost you. Okay. Do the sh screen share again. <laughs> and make this larger so everyone can see and get it from the beginning. Okay, John of Damascus, the forgotten apologist. And um, just before we get into him, <laughs> I wanna talk about this gentleman. Um, anyone recognize who he is just by the little meme down at the bottom, the, the phrases down there? Saint, Saint Nicholas. That is Saint Nicholas. <laughs> I find it a little um, funny, maybe a little ironic, um, because his commemoration day, which is today, um, remember, he's the one who punched out Arius at the council. Um, it's my baptismal birthday today. And I find it a little ironic that he went against the heretics. And that's kind of what I do a little bit of. Um, so I just realized today that his commemoration day is on my baptismal birthday. And I thought that was really cool. Um, it also has led to many conversations today, other than trying to write my paper for school, with my Calvinist and non-Lutheran friends in explaining that all the promises of God, even though my conversion was in September 8, 1986, all the promises and the fullness of everything, all of God's gifts were given to me in those baptismal waters. If you've read the Accidental Lutheran, I explain when my pastor gave me Romans 6 to read in preparation of my baptism, I kept looking at it going, there's something more to baptism than they're telling me. <laughs> of course, then they told me, oh, you might get the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your water baptism. That didn't happen. I so I thought, well, nothing really happened. And that only fueled my insecurity in my salvation. But now as a Lutheran, an ancient church Christian follower, um, I now know all those promises were given in the waters of baptism. And so I thought it a little ironic that the heretic puncher is commemorated on my baptism birthday. So there's that. Okay, on to continuing. I don't know if any of you picked up the book or put it on your wish list. Um, the Exposition of the Orthodox Faith. I want to do a quick review. What he taught Christians to do in this was to defend the faith, contend for the faith, and proclaim the faith. And that's what we're gonna look at part of how he did that. As a base, the ancient church did everything under these two questions. Who is the God we worship or who is God? What has he done? In answering those two questions, we give the gospel to those who are asking us. So when you are engaged with a non-believer or someone in a different denomination, whether it's heterodox or heretical, keep those two things in mind. You want to tell them and proclaim to them who this God is that we worship okay and then then we can tell them what he's done what he's done in creation what he's done in salvation and what he will be doing when he returns so if we keep those two uh questions in our mind or statements in our mind we want to do who he is what he's done you'll be able to keep your mind then focused when you're trying to figure out which of those two answers their question, okay? And then from that, you can use the Apostles' Creed to bring things back to your mind, 
or the Nicene Creed even. I doubt any of us have memorized the Athanasian Creed. <laughs> That's very long. We sit down in church when it's at, uh, Trinity Sunday. So let's take a look again. His two points, our two points. Now, he said in his uh, work, in the exposition of the Orthodox faith, he said this, knowledge about God comes from the prophets, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that is true. We can, we talked last week about general revelation. We look at the stars and we know that didn't happen by accident. We look at the structure of trees. We could look at the structure of an eyeball and realize that didn't just happen by accident. There is architecture there. There is design. There is reason to the design. And it's the reason part that distinguishes us from any evolutionist or anyone who says, oh, it just happened. Because there's reasoning behind there. There's reasons your eye operates the way it does. There's mystery still how it communicates images to our brain. And so, but we only know there's someone outside of us, bigger than us, not us, um, a designer, an architect, a maker, however you want to put it. We only get that knowledge from nature. But the important things, who he really is, and what he has done only comes from the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament. And we know this is true. He says, and I quote, knowledge of the existence of God is implanted in us by nature. Romans 1.18 says they all know there's a God that exists, but we proactively squish it down. Because if we have someone who is greater than us who made us, suddenly we got an answer to them and we don't like that. Um, he then goes on, who is God? God is uncreated. He's always existed. And we talked about how that can make our brains stretch when we try to do the eternality in the past before us. Easier to go eternality going forward, but going for us in the past, that's hard. But we need to recognize God has God is not created. He is God. He has always existed. He's always eternal. He's always ever present and omniscient and, omni and uh, omnipotent and all of that. And so when we're presenting God, this is who God is. He's always, he's just always, always. That's it. We can't say always been because that might mean a, starting point. So he's just always, or as the ancient church would say, uncreate or uncreated. Um, second thing of who he's, who is God, he created everything. Therefore, he's the creator. And I love this line in uh, section three of the book, paragraph four. We do not attribute such a power to the spontaneous. He's talking about creation. And so when um, theological evolutionists try to tell me, well, you see, God started it and then he let it go. No, no, no. Uh, might as well shovel that out of the chicken coop and put it in, in, in your little compost heap because that's what it's worth. Even then, way before Darwin, there were people who said, oh, it just came to being, boof, poof, it was, it was there. Boom, it was there, okay? Um, no, we don't attribute creation to this spontaneous idea that just, poof, it existed with no one bringing it to existence. And I love that line in the book. I highlighted it because it's an answer to those Christians who still believe in evolution. Either Genesis one through three, or they even stretch it to seven, is true, or you're deciding then what is true in God's word. None of that 
in Genesis 1 through 7 is in allegorical language. It's all factual. It speaks of a day as a day, 20, you know, morning and evening, and it was day. Morning and evening, and it was the fourth day. Morning and evening, it was the sixth day. So here, John of Damascus is saying, no, no, no. We don't attribute the creation of the world to some spontaneous thing without the creator speaking it into existence. Okay. All right. Again, who is God? Who is this who we are worshiping? We're answering that first question. In essence, in nature, he is absolutely incomprehensible and unknowable to our feeble brain. Someone last week, and I used it in my paper, said it's, a, it's, a, it's like an ant trying to understand human. Who was that? Was that you, Donna? That said that last was week or was Donna that from Australia? Ah, Donna from Australia. Right. Yeah. But it is very much, and I actually used that line in my paper today. Um, it really is where, unless God told him who he told us who he is, totally incomprehensible. And still trying to think about God, that can really twist your brain. And it can me it, for me. It sometimes makes me kind of scrunch my face because I'm trying to understand God. You just can't. However, there are things we do know. He has no body, so he's incorporeal. He's infinite. He is boundless. This is important. If God has no bound, no boundary. Then there can't be another God with him because that God would take up that some of that space. So one God, and I'll, I'll, you'll see the other side says God is one. Okay. Formless, intangible, and invisible. We can't see God directly. We can through Jesus Christ who incarnated himself so that he was tangible um, Thomas put his hands in the wounds in the resurrected savior. Uh, we know he cried. We know that he, uh, slept. He got tired. Uh, we know he got hungry, but as far as God is prior to the incarnation, couldn't touch God, couldn't see God. God is one. And the scripture now, when you're reading this, you are not going to find that he says you find this in Deuteronomy 13.2, or this is John 16.4. No, it's just quoting the scriptures. So this is what he uses to talk about God as one. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Well, that's Exodus, right? That's the Exodus passage where we're about to get the Ten Commandments. And he says, thou shalt have no other God before me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, for I am the first God and I am the last, and beside me there is not God. That's from Isaiah. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God. Often when he's quoting the scriptures, he'll say, David said this, Moses said this, Isaiah said this, John said this, but you're not going to find chapter and verse. So you might want to keep a concordance with you and look up some of the verses, maybe mark it in the book if you choose to get the book. But this is who he describes as one, meaning there is only one God. There are not many. There are no little gods like the charismatics like to tell us we are. There are no other gods or one day God was man and became God. There's none of that. God was always God. God is always, and leave it there. Okay. So the word, well, what, what do we do with this whole Trinitarian concept now? God is one. And yet we call God, we call Jesus the son, God, the son. Doesn't that make two? What about the Holy Spirit? Doesn't that make three? Persons three, one God. Now watch his argument. God, 
and he's talking of the father, is not wordless. In other words, God isn't just up there and not saying anything. Just, no, he has the word. But the word isn't subsisting in him, meaning it's a whole new other part of him. It's always been there. The word has always been God. Because he speaks, that's God speaking. The word is God speaking. And the word doesn't have a beginning. Because if you have a beginning with the word and the word is God, you would then have two gods, one who was always and is always, and then one who had a beginning. That would be two. Go back to the other and the scriptures he used, God is one. The word does not have an end. See, all books have a final page, hopefully. <laughs> they have an end. The word who is God has no end. Oh, eternal. He didn't have a beginning. He didn't have an end. <gasps> that means the word is eternal and only God can be eternal. Therefore, the son of God, the word is God. And then the word never exists in himself. It's not the word does because the word is God's word. It's not the word is the word's word. So he exists within God. He is God because he has no beginning and no end. All right, the Holy Spirit. The word possesses wisdom. In the ancient documents of the church, you often find like Cyril of Alexandria, Athanasius, Irenaeus, Gregory of Nyssa, Basil, speaking, uh, even um, Timothy the, uh, from Baghdad, who was the second Muslim apologist, when they speak of the Holy Spirit, they will often just say the Spirit, or they will say wisdom. They call the Spirit wisdom. Now, if we're talking... Hopefully there's some thought behind it. And the thought doesn't separate from the words. Neither does the spirit who is the wisdom of God get separated from the word or the father. So the, he says the spirit didn't gain admission into God from outside of God, but wisdom is in the word and the father. And wisdom proceeds from the Father and rests in the Word. So these are different ways to talk about the Trinity. We've talked about the triangle with the circle in the middle. We've talked about um, how trying to explain the Trinity, things kind of fall apart if we try to use like the three-leaf clover or an egg, or the three states of water, they all fall apart at some point. The ancient church fathers, the patristic fathers, had a way of talking about the triunity of God by not separating the three, only distinguishing them. The father, speaks the word with the wisdom from himself, which rests in the word. You can't have a father not speaking. The word needs a speaker and the spirit needs to come from God. So that's a better way, I think, to figure out the Trinity and try to explain it. Now, yesterday, I was uh, coloring an Advent candle with my Sunday school student. And we were talking about Jesus coming to earth. And he looked at me. He was, Miss Nancy, but Jesus is God. He's always been here. 
And I looked at this five-year-old <laughs> and I said, yes, he's always been here, but there was a day he came to be a baby. And he looked at me, he goes, that's okay. He's still God. A five-year-old got it. Us older folks, we tend to try to confuse things and complicate things. He understood that Jesus is God, that he always was and always is. And if you could put it in technological terms, he always existed and always will exist. To little Matthew, he's God. There's no question. And if you ask him, who is Jesus? He's God. He's God. And who is the father? He's God. And so uh, because he understood, he's always been. And he always will be. So a five-year-old was able to get it. All right, next. I'm going to skip that part. Okay. I want to go through the sheets I emailed you. If you didn't get a chance to print it out, it's okay. I'm going to read parts of it. But I want to look at the Trinity. And it's in chapter eight of his book. And at the bottom of the sheet, I sent you the link where you can read his whole book, which is great. CCEL.org has a lot of these older books and you can download them even as a Kindle or PDF um, or just read them on the screen. So I wanna read just this part. I'm gonna break it up a little bit. And I want you to tell me, or better yet, and we're gonna switch off the screen share. I don't want to see your faces, your beautiful faces. Okay. If you got a chance to read it, what was familiar? What was not familiar? So just unmute yourself, start talking. I read the first, maybe half of the first page, but the wording, very familiar. Yeah. What, what part of it was familiar? Um, only begotten son, um, light of light, mm -hmm. whom all things were made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you starting to, to hear things everyone else here is familiar with? In my paper today, let me get my book. I was using, do you remember Irenaeus of Lyon? We went through him, remember? I love Irenaeus. Remember, he's the one that told us about the rule of faith. And the rule of faith is that creed that came roughly 300 years before the Apostles' Creed was actually written. And it talks about, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ born of the virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate. These are all familiar things. And if you read this document, he is continuing that tradition. And some traditions are really good because we need to hold to these things. Athanasius, I got a pile of books here. All right, Athanasius, I was writing my report on him. And he was saying, let me get the right. Okay. Um, every ill and heresy borrows scriptural language as a cloak wherewith to sow the ground with his own poison and seduce the simple. So men like Arian, Montanists, um, Marcion, they all borrowed Christian language. Mormons, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, modern-day cults, borrow language from the Bible and even from the creeds, even if they hate the creeds, because they want to seduce the simple, as Athanasius said. They want to spread their poison to the simple. What does he mean by simple? He does not mean idiots. He means those who don't 
read. Those who don't study. Um, so we have here John of Damascus saying, we believe then in one God, creator of all created things, seen and unseen. Where do we get that phrase, seen and unseen in our creed? Which one of the three creeds, the major ones, is that in? Long one. Hmm? It's the long one. I can't remember. The, the long one. Athanasius. No, not that one. The second long nice. one. Nicene. 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 Yes. We, and isn't that fabulous? Remember we looked at how Dem John of Damascus said, we don't believe in just spontaneousness in creation. How did they know in the 300s that there were things they didn't see in creation? Got to think. They knew it from scripture. They knew that God created things they could not see yet. And so when the evolutionist comes to you, just simply say, hey, God is the creator of the seen and the unseen. Just because the cartoon pictures and the coloring book pictures have the creation part we can see in it, and that's how children are taught, does not mean we don't believe God created every single thing, whether we could see it or not see it. And the fact that the fourth century church had the prescience, prescience to include that, to me, just verifies the creedal statement. Now he continues. Um, hold on, I gotta find my little tick mark. Uh, okay. Da, 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 da. Oh, and that we believe in Father and Son and Holy Spirit, where into also we've been baptized. For so our Lord commanded the apostles to baptize, saying, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He goes on. Now we're going to talk more detail about the Son. We believe in one Father, the beginning, and cause of everything, begotten of no one. Okay, but then he goes on, his only begotten son, our Lord and God, and God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and producer of the Holy Spirit. Now, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? That's how we confess it in the creeds. He used the term producer pretty much the same terminology. And then he goes on as Dorothy noticed, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the father through whom all things were made. And we say he was before all ages. We show that his birth is without time or beginning for the son of God was not brought into being out of nothing. In other words, he wasn't created. And then he goes on and he said, he talks about the word, the essential and perfect living image of the unseen God. There is a passage in John that I think you're all familiar with. Do you remember when Philip comes up to him? He says, teacher, teacher, we believe everything you say, but show us the father. What was Jesus's response? What did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the father, basically. Right. right. So when people say to you, show me God. Okay. Let's look into the scriptures. Because who does the written word tell us about? Jesus, right? Yes. And we call Jesus the living word. And if you want to see who God is, you need to look at who Jesus is. My professor gave us a challenge. He said, for the next week, don't speak in this way. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He said, just speak God. If you're talking of Jesus during this Advent season, speak of God coming. If you're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, speak of God, I don't know, sanctifying you or, um, you know, he prays with us when we pray. And so pull away from talking the three to readjust your mind that they're all one. In persons, they are three. In nature, they are one. They're one God. We speak of three persons and then all the things that each does. And yet all of them all do the same thing. The only thing the spirit didn't do and the father didn't do, they didn't come in the flesh and die and rise again. And yet Jesus was still God dying on the cross. So. A challenge, I'll give you the same challenge this week. Just when you think, as we're, especially at this Christmas season, like my little five-year-old in Sunday school, Jesus is God, always was. Okay, Matthew. And often when we ask for a specific thing that Jesus did, his response is God did that. It, it puts a, it, it kind of forces us to remember we that the three are one and so I'll, I'll leave that there he goes on and he says um there was never a time when the father was and the son was not but always the father and always the son and then always the spirit and his point is he is remember he's working in a muslim world okay who hate the idea of trinity and so his argument that we'll get into next week with the muslims is using that the father the word the wisdom of god and so um any questions about this today because i want to get into some scenarios you might come up against okay dan okay so um I hear what you're saying about um, using God language. Um, and, and I think that is great to emphasize that, yes, we're celebrating the incarnation of God at Christmas. Uh, on the other hand, I think what many evangelical churches are, are challenged with today is using the name of Jesus. And all they do is use God and Lord. And you don't hear any Jesus talk. So I think it depends on your audience, who you're talking with. Mm -hmm. Because when I was in VBS, I was doing VBS, I always made sure all those children heard Jesus, 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 because in their own churches, they're hearing God, 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 God. And like we just talked about, well, you want to know about God, who do you look to? You look to Jesus, right? So I think both are very important it's just you know who are you talking to right that's a good point and i apologize i didn't clarify that i'm talking when you're thinking about it yeah when you when you're in a conversation maybe with another believer strong believer not baby and when you talk about god came to bethlehem god was born through mary that'll blow their mind because we have to remember that little infant that had to rely on mom to feed and mom to change the diapers is God. And so it, I, I will couch it that among strong believers or in your own thinking about the season, I would absolutely agree with you, Dan, that I would not be using that with unbelievers or baby Christians or evangelicals, because you're right. I mean, most of their songs talk about God or Lord, not Jesus himself. So that, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. 
Oh, um, I'm sorry. Um, one, one more little one on the on on his statement here up at the top. There's a lot of um, adjectives to use to describe God, and and most of them I find are are, are negative. <laughs> we do it in the <laughs> negative a lot. Yeah, we do. But there's one here where it shouldn't passionless i'm wondering what he meant by passionless like he doesn't have any feelings or what what would that was he referring to there well, i will check into that in the original greek because i'm gonna think he's thinking you know the fluctuation of emotions there there isn't that in god okay you know um sporadic like we would do or extreme like we would do so but i will look into that and see if in the original um there's a better word that might be more comprehensible for our 20th century um thinking or 21st i guess right now okay thanks um, i'll look into that and then get back to everyone on that okay other questions on John of Damascus and his actual creedal formula here. Okay, thinking about how I've taught you to do apologetics, rubber hits the road, right? Let's do some rubber hit in the road. All right, Mormon comes to your door and they're gonna tell you they believe in one God. Respond, we believe in God the Father too. We believe that Jesus came. They would say we believe in Jesus, period. But what Jesus do they believe in? Ah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to play the Mormon. Ask me questions that get me to have to respond. Who is your Jesus? Well, he's the son of the father. Is he equal with the father? <laughs> now I'm going to ask Jeremy. Jeremy, as a former Mormon, answer that like a Mormon would. Oh, he's not listening. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so a Mormon would probably respond um, by lying because they want to get you to the point of you come with them to steakhouse. Well, yes, he's equal. You know, he was once a man and now he's God. We're men, we can become God. How do you respond to that? There is only one God. Don't you just mean one God for this planet? Well, I think at that point I'd be getting into the etern eternality of God uh, and that Jesus is God because God the Father can only be the Father if Jesus the Son was there with him. So there is only one God and that God is eternal. And so there is no uh, claiming of new gods when we pass to whatever other world they're hoping for. Kathy, I want to backtrack on what you said back to he couldn't be eternally father if Jesus at some point came to be. Right. So Jesus is eternal with God the Father. That would mean there was no point in Mormon theology or mythology where truly the God of this universe never was also God, the son. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And he, they, I mean, they have it backwards. They have it. Well, Jesus was a man and then he became God. So we can do that too. No, Jesus was always God became a man. Okay. The God, the God part came okay. first and then man came. Right. Remember the argument <laughs> that John of Damascus made last in the lesson last week that you can't have God as eternal father, as the scriptures call him, if he also did not have an eternal son. Right. 
think about us. My dad did not become a dad till my brother Peter was born. He was the first of us. He was just a husband and a man and a son and a grandson, but he could not be a dad, father, until he had a son. So you can't have that person of God the Father unless there was always God the Son. Okay, let's switch to a different cult. Ready? <laughs> let's go to Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, we don't believe in the Trinity. That's a Roman Catholic idea. How do you respond to that? Oh, you're going to have to think way back to lessons last year. No clue. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God in First John. Okay. That if is something is if something is with God, it's got to be um, more than just God. I mean, more than just God the Father. Okay. Well, the word was God. It says right after that, so yeah. it's basically saying that. Okay, I'm going to answer you like they would. Ready? You're all going to need to learn Greek. But see, the original Greek uses the prepositional phrase "a." He was a God. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. I'm going to have to remember. Someone sent me an email reminding me to give the clip out of my Greek textbook. Just send me an email. Nancy, send us the clip in the Greek textbook. Okay. Um, the thing is, in the Greek, it doesn't say a uh, God. Okay. Um, but... How many here have taken Greek and understood it? Okay, I'm, I'm in the midst and I'm struggling, but I'm doing okay. I'm holding my own by God's grace. Trust me, it's God's grace. Um, the best argument is not John 1.1 1, 1, because they're gonna overload you with what the Greek teaches and what the Greek teachers say and their Greek teachers are wrong. A better argument is Oh, you don't believe that, well, okay, here's the argument. If Jesus is not God, why did they bow to him? Why did Thomas say, my Lord and my God? Another is out of one of the three sixteens. If you ever look in the Bible and look at three sixteens, all the chapters in that of chapter three and verse sixteen, most of them have fabulous content. Second Timothy three sixteen, that God was in the world, reconciling us to Himself. So when you're reading the Bible and it's a three sixteen, just note if it's something really really good you can use later. Um, but God was in the world, reconciling himself, us to himself. God was in Christ, reconciling us to the world. Re reconciling the world to himself, right? Yep. So God was in Christ. Oh, well, there, there we go. Now, what about um, the idea that they're going to tell you that Jesus was really Michael the archangel? How do you prove that? <laughs> well, okay. There's a good way to approach it. Ask them to prove it. They'll take you to Daniel, where Michael is spoken of as battling the forces again that stand against God. And they'll say, see, that's Michael the angel. And so Jesus is Michael the archangel. Approach it from the way Athanasius would have, if Jesus is a created being, 
and he had to pay for the sins. How did he do that being a created being? Is he strong enough? Is he worthy enough? Is he holy enough? Can he take on the sins of the world and survive the wrath of God? But aren't the JWs going to deny that Jesus' um, death on the cross was um, a, a, an atoning sacrifice? Well, they'll call it an atonement, but it really doesn't do any atoning. And then that would be the next thing to approach with them. Did the death of Jesus do anything? So let me play the Jehovah's Witness and I'll give you their answer and then you try to respond to me. Well, see, the death of Jesus was an example for us. How do we battle that? What, to be to be self-sacrificing? An example to be self, is that what they mean? Mm -mm. Well, an example to us in how we should obey God. Example and obedience. Mm -hmm. So they want us to all die on a cross. Uh, <laughs> maybe not that far. <laughs> but they want us to... Um, they want us to recognize that we have to do what Jesus did. So, you know, Jesus followed the law. We have to, too. Answer that one. Well, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Jesus or God is not, it, it's black and white. He, you either obey him perfectly or you don't. There's no gray area there where you can, where God's going to grade on the curve and say you've obeyed well enough. Oh, well enough. I like that phrase. I like that phrase, Dan. All right, let's go with, um, let's do, go with the, you know what? Let me do the lady who delivered my groceries last week. She said to me, she liked my nativity that sits on my front step. It's just a little one. It's just Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. And she said, oh, that's really nice. And I said, well, thank you. And she goes, it's, it's nice and simple. She was like, you know, um, what church do you go to? So I said, Faith Lutheran. Oh, I'm at the Mormon Steakhouse right down Garrett. I go to church too. What should my response have been? I might have asked her. I what see the, Dorothy covering her face. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, "God, give me wisdom." Okay, that's, that's the important. First thing you should pray for. I would ask her, "What do they teach at your church about Jesus?" Dan, were you listening in on my conversation? Because that <laughs> is what I asked her. Well, I said, "No fair." He's a trained pastor. No fair. <laughs> <laughs> I said to her, I said, so um, what is it about your Jesus that I wouldn't learn about my Jesus at my church? And we had a 15 minute conversation on my porch because she said, well, you know, he had a brother. And I said, oh, you mean Lucifer? And she goes, yeah, you know that? And I said, yes. I said, but the Bible doesn't talk about Jesus having a brother. <laughs> And she goes, no, no. And we went to the scriptures on my phone because I wasn't running into the house and losing her. And <laughs> so I had my phone and we went right to the scriptures. How Christ is our brother because he's made the sacrifice. But it doesn't say there he had a brother named Lucifer and that the devil is a created being. And she goes, well, Jesus is too. And I said, How? And she proceeded to explain to me what you should only learn after you become a Mormon, that God, the father, Elohim and his wife create procreated right. Jesus. And I said, but the Bible calls Jesus Lord. Curios. And she goes, yes. And I said, what does that word mean? And she said, well, master. I said, yes. Who alone are we to call master? 
And she goes, oh, God. Right. So if someone called Jesus master and they didn't get corrected, and in fact, people were told, you must call him Kurios, Lord, master. What does that tell us about Jesus? And at that point, she said to me, literally, I got to go. And <laughs> off she went. Thus <laughs> ended that conversation. I don't know if I'll get the same delivery lady when I order my Albertsons this week. <laughs> or if she's just going to quickly drop on my porch, ring the doorbell and run. But <laughs> there was good talking too. And the thing is, when we all learn together how the ancient church approached the doctrine of the Trinity, we find a real simple way to do it, that God is, God is always, there's no beginning, no end. The scripture speaks of Jesus, son of God, as always, no beginning, no end, and speaks of the Holy Spirit as always, no beginning, no end. We do not believe in three gods, so they are one God, three persons. And if we can grasp how they understood the Father speaks the word, which is Christ, and proceeds from wisdom, the spirit, we can get a better sense, I hope, of the difficult doctrine of the Trinity. Because it is a hard doctrine. Go ahead, Dan. I think you did something very clever. You may not have even realized you did it, but I bet you did. When you were talking to the lady, in my 40 years of experiencing Mormons from college onward, they spent a lot of time trying to tell me how we're not that much different. I even had one tell me, well, you're Lutheran. At least you're not one of the Catholics. In other words, trying to put me on their side versus the Catholics. They're the original church growth church. And they're always trying to make everyone feel comfortable with them by not, you know, we have a few differences here. You really should know about them. What you did is you called their bluff and you said, oh, I'm going to hear about Jesus too. And as if presuming that we weren't that different, although you knew that we, they were, you said, what wouldn't I hear in my church that I would hear in theirs and make them point out the differences? So I don't know if you even realized you did that, but knowing how Mormons always want to unify and make a sound not themselves sound not so different. Now you made them call out the differences. Did you fall asleep during that lesson in, in Strasbourg, my friend? <laughs> no, I no. Uh, Pastor Coleman said I did. No, I, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> because in the session on Mormonism, that was one of the tactics that Dr. Montgomery used. Call them on their bluff, basically. Uh, he didn't use those terms, or maybe he did. He might have used crankier terms than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if any of you meet him, you'll know why I say that. Um, but it is, hey, what's different about mine than yours? Why is yours different? Why is yours better than mine? Um, make well, I think he put it this way. You put the weight of the argument of truth on them. Especially if it's a cult. If you're dealing with a non-believer, um, agnostic, atheist, you probably won't get into the Trinitarian debate unless they bring it up. And then the simplified view of the Father always, the Son always, the Spirit always. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one. Go ahead, Dorothy. Which one of you was it that said, uh, oh, you're like the Catholics? Which one of your persona just now? Mormons. Oh, that's like the Catholics, he said. And I think well, I'm a lifelong Lutheran. A yeah, I'm oh. lifelong Lutheran. That stuck me right there. I couldn't think. Was it the that Mormons? was that was the missionary talking to me, trying to tell me you'd be, you know, almost or inferring you'd be a great Mormon. I mean, we're not that much different. We're not like the Catholics. So they were trying to divide the Catholics and us. We had our own reformation, right? We didn't need to have that happen. But, you know, as a, and then unify us with them. It was a psychological tool. They're probably trained in the seminary, the missionary training center. Actually, I had a Muslim say that to me as well once. Really? Yep. Yeah. 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 Because their, their idea of the Trinity is uh, God the Father, uh, Mary, 
and mm-hmm. God the Son, Jesus. And I went, where did Mary get in there? And she goes, oh, well, that's what the Catholics believe. And I'm going, I found out later, no, that's not what the Catholics believe. I mean, I knew knew that already. It's what the Mormons have been taught in, or uh, Muslims have been taught in the Quran. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I heard this week, um, because remember, I had the interview last week <laughs> and wanted to know all the stuff that I got behind me, right? My icons, my cross and so forth. And they asked, are you Catholic? And I heard a better response than I gave. It was, I'm Catholic, not Roman. I'm Orthodox, (laughs) not Eastern. I'm Evangelical, not modern. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that that's who we are as Lutherans. We are Catholic, or as Jean Edward V said, we are the true Western Catholic Church we carried on what the church of the West believed and then got all screwed up with Roman emperors and popes and popes becoming emperors or trying to be emperors and everything got all screwed up. Um, But the Lutheran church, the German branch of the reformation, the Lutherans are the true Western church or the other term he used was uh, the first evangelicals. And I like that too, but I liked, I think, I don't remember which pastor it was, may have been Preus on, on Facebook. I'm Catholic, not Roman. I'm Orthodox, not Eastern. I'm Evangelical, not Modern. So, all right. Uh, any other questions about today? How would these, how would these groups deal with the, with the scripture? If you've seen me, you've seen the father. I mean, who of us can say that? Well, none of us could say that about ourselves, but Jesus said it. So that's, yeah, that's, I wonder how these other groups would deal with that. Never looked into that, but that is something I'm waiting for the opportunity to use in conversation. And then I'll, or you guys use it if it comes up like that. And you let me know how they answer it. Um, Because we're always learning all together and everything. And um, I really appreciate you guys being here and everything too. Um, Okay, well, it's almost three o'clock. So any other questions or comments? I just wanted to say we have some friends in Denver that are Mormon. And um, they were, last time we were out there, they were making a, 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 the husband was making a real big pitch that um, they're, they're just, they're a Christian church their Christian nomination. So yeah. it's, it's, I think that's, I think that's being really pushed from the leadership because they don't want to be considered a cult. Right. Jeremy is saying uh, Mormons see more interested. No Mormons. Mm-hmm. Mormons often say the Godhead is one in purpose. Uh, so they might redefine oneness. They probably do. In fact, they do. Jehovah's Witnesses too. They'll say, well, they're they're one in purpose. Anti-Trinitarians, Pentecostals, they will say the same thing, one in purpose. But is that what the scripture says? Does it actually say that? No. They are one. I and the Father are one. Doesn't it doesn't add, and and there is a Greek word for purpose that would have explained that, but it's not there. It's the same when um, Baptists will say baptism is a symbol, and that you know your water baptism means nothing. Uh, that's just your decision. Really, is that what the Bible says? So just like the ancient church fathers were always quoting Old and New Testament to make their point, we need to get that into our brains as well and into our hearts because um, we need the reasoning from God's word to respond to their rebuke of certain doctrines, their attempted rebuttals, their human reasoning. Um, So we need to be so entrenched in God's word, just like these gentlemen, 
where when you read it, you know you're reading scripture, even though they're not giving a biblical reference, because they knew it so much, they could just incorporate it into their writings, and in such a way that it brought the truth out for their argument, for their position. Um, so I would encourage everyone to get that way with the Bible and get it in our brains because when we need to respond, we need to respond from God's word because God told us his gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it's through the foolishness of preaching, right? It's through the foolishness of proclaiming that God has chosen to bring people in. So at this Advent season, when people are open to why God came in the flesh and his name is Jesus, who will save his people from their sins, why? Bring them in the answer. You know, he didn't come as a baby just to be cute and adorable. He came to die and rise again and conquer sin, death, and the devil. So, all right, everyone. Um, next week, I have a final. So we're going to push the next one to the 20th of December. Okay. Um, so I won't see you next week, but I will be here on the 20th of December. Uh, and that'll be after a four hour Greek class. Actually, not a class, a Greek exam. It's my final on the 20th. But after I'm done, I'm going to be so relieved. I'm going to want to chit chat with you guys. So <laughs> everyone have a great week and great next week and enjoy your Advent services and this whole holiday season and look for opportunities to be the apologists you are for the Christian faith. You, you know more than you think you know now. Okay. And even if you're nervous or you don't get it right, that's okay. God, God can use a crooked stick. He uses me all the time and I'm pretty broken. So on that note, I will see everyone in two weeks. The Lord bless you and keep you. You too, Nancy. God bless. Bye-bye.